Welcome to Prime Life. We call it Retirement 2.0. Leave each episode with tips and new ideas to help you navigate retirement in our new age. It's your time. Make it count. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended as medical, investment, or financial advice. We do not sponsor or endorse any of the individuals, companies, products, or services featured on this podcast. Any statements or opinions expressed are of the individual who makes them. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, my name is Mary Crean, and welcome to another episode of the Prime Live Podcast. Joseph, how are you doing today? Great to be with you, Mary. Good to be back on another episode. Excited for our conversation. I am too, and thanks for joining me. But we have someone really very cool on our podcast, our guest, and I would love for you to introduce her. Thank you. It's me my pleasure. So Lorette Cl- Cl- Clear, sorry about that, is a career educator and extensive with extensive experience in creating literacy environments to engage the reluctant reader and writer. She has championed underserved, underserved populations as a grant writer for the last 25 years, creating programs to augment curricula in urban and priority schools. Lorette has taken her love of liter- literature and literacy from the classroom to the boardroom and now to elder care with her award-winning series, Nana's Books. A spirited advocate for compassionate care initiatives, Lorette is a member of the Connecticut Caregivers for Com- for Compromise and CT911, dedicated to combating loneliness and isolation in long-term care. Welcome to the show, Lorette. Please elaborate on that and tell us more about what you do. Sure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Essentially, I have books that are adaptive and that are accessible for people that are living with brain changes. Um, They're particularly geared toward older adults that are, you know, that whether they're aging in place or they're in living in a care setting, they no longer have access to books that are resonant with them, mainly because they are a traditional book. Let's say the Bible. Let's say that was a big a cornerstone of what you'd like to read, or let's say your daily newspaper, um, or let's say you like large print fiction. Those kinds of things are no longer accessible due to the formatting and so many things that really other people that are living with brain changes and with macular degeneration and all kinds of um, low vision. So my quest or my passion for this work started with my mother-in-law, Mary, who lived in the Boston area with Lewy body dementia. She was diagnosed in around 2017 and she was an avid reader and she loved the Boston Globe. Uh, she loved the Patriot Ledger. She read that cover to cover and that kind of book ends to her day. And she'd also read in the evenings. And when we'd visit her from Connecticut, we'd go quite a bit. Um, she was becoming more dispirited and just less and less herself. And it was really difficult. And at the time, my twins were around 11 years old or so. And in addition to being dispirited, she was actually very, very negative and very, um, she was struggling, you know, and, and she was suffering. And I thought they need something that they can talk about. So my son, Michael, would show her all kinds of things on his phone. And that was, you know, that was challenging. Um, and my background was I started out in, uh, the early nineties in Massachusetts and then Connecticut as a first grade teacher. And my job was to welcome people into the reading and writing process, the whole, under the whole language umbrella. And I'd always get the kids who were the reluctant readers and writers who I was, I was telling Mary, when we first spoke, there was a big space between their current ability, which they couldn't read and their interest level. So their, um, intellect was fantastic. It was just they needed the basic skills so that they could access these materials that really spoke to them. So I was like, you know, I was modifying X-Men comic books and doing all kinds of things that were appealing to children and giving them the the visuals and the auditory stimulation, meaning like I'd read aloud to them and with them and I'd give them opportunities where they could, you know, on a one-on-one, which I thought was the gold standard always um, basis, could really engage in these materials together. And I had not thought about that in many, many years. 
And prior to that, when I was in high school, I worked in geriatrics as a volunteer. And I was there for sundowning every time I went because I went at four o'clock in the afternoon. But that was in the 80s. I didn't know what, what that was, nor did, uh, honestly, the medical community. So fast forward 30 years and three kids and, you know, um, countless, you know, professional iterations, I I said, I can make books for my mother-in-law. And first, let's find out what's out there. And what I found was 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 there was modified children's books, or excuse me, repurposed children's books or modified, um, really just very, uh, almost like juvenile, uh, at, you know, the imagery and, or board books, worst of all, that were like a nursery type of a book for children or old shelter magazines like Food and Wine or travel and leisure. And you can't do any of those things anymore. You don't have the agency to choose those things. And she was no longer at the head of a household. So I decided to take a stab at, at creating books of my own for her. And she was in a sunrise community and it just skyrocketed because people in the community thought, where's the book? I, I, you know, I love that book. And I just kept making books, thematic books that spoke to people. And that's, that's how it all started. So I love what you said. And it's interesting. My husband is a teacher. He is, this is not his first career. And he has many students that have um, some challenges. And I remember one summer school, he actually did almost exactly what you did with pulling like magazines together of particular interests of some of the, his students. And it really worked. They were very engaged. So it's just interesting that, you know, because, you know, you sharing that and hearing that, like you were, you know, spot on to, to understand that, you know, I think, it, you know, your background as a teacher, obviously, I think has helped you. But let's t talk a little bit about, you know, where you started and kind of where you are today and what kind of transformation has taken place, not only perhaps in the content, in the imagery, but also in in your business to to do this um, so that others who are neurodivergent or, you know, whatever their challenge may be, can enjoy the type of books that you're offering. Um, you know, I, I've found in the last like, even just six months, I think I started in during COVID March of 2019. Um, and I found that there are like Mirador Magazine, there are now resources that are really, really outstanding that are, let's say, not just run of the mill or, or that are just really outstanding in their own right. Um, Mirador just got, um, you know, a mature media award, a gold award, the highest award for excellence in these publications. I received a mature media award. Um, Richard Ferry of the Corn Ferry Foundation, um, you know, the executive search firm created the Mods Awards in 2021 for in honor of his wife, Maud, because he just couldn't find materials that were engaging um, for her and that were meaningful to her. Um, so I won a Mods Award in 2021. And then this year I was honored by, it was lovely, um, the, I'm a certified senior advisor by the um, Society of Certified Senior Advisors up in Indiana for, um, that was where their annual conference was. And it was uh, for, um, let's see, uh, service to seniors. And it was for my, these providing these resources to veterans and to, you know, all kinds of, you know, um, diverse elders. And so, so really the, the tide is turning and, and people are looking at these types of resources and saying like, this really works. My mother hasn't spoken in a year and a half. And we had like a, an extensive, beautiful, really connected conversation for the first time in a really long time. So these books knock that fourth wall down in a long-term care or, you know, a home setting where, you know, you, let's say particularly in a locked unit, you don't see that nature. You don't see the, walk the halls of a museum again. So it brings in those gorgeous visuals and, you know, just the beautiful sights and sounds of things that are relatable and, and give people that sense of participation and an agency and, and, that I call it like an interlude because it really is more than just a little chat. You really do utilize this nostalgia as opposed to reminiscence. I can talk about that. Um, and it brings people to a space where they, it, it gives them grace. It gives them the grace to have that opportunity to talk about their past, their likes, their people. You retain your aesthetic, you retain your intellect. You, you just have so much to offer still. And, 
And I love the fact that this is coming to light right now. So you mentioned Mirador Magazine. We, we did do an episode with those founders. Uh, great, great conversation there. So what makes your books effective? And, and maybe elaborate a little on the topics of your books. You know, the Mirador Magazine, to use that as an example, they, you know, they cover a variety of topics and mm -hmm. they've adapted the magazine format. You know, maybe explain what you're doing with the book and, and why it's different than the magazine. And, and again, the topics would be interesting, I think. Sure. So Mirador is arts based and it's, it's a visual feast. I love what they do. They're dear friends of mine now. Um, and it's got a little bit of something for everyone, uh, you know, activities and, th you know, things of that nature and, and just something that you can engage in independently or you can engage in, um, you know, one on one or or with, you know, with a little group. So there's there are so many possibilities there. My books are dovetailed really nicely with their publication um, because I've got now almost 40 titles and really a lot of it is based in identity. So as I said, veterans, uh, I've got books for non-denominational Christians. I have books for um, a book of spirituality by Rumi. I have haiku. I have um, Judaica. So really people lean into faith when they're in life review and they're, you know, really examining, you know, they're looking back across the landscape of their lives and they've got all kinds of time on their hands and the visuals are just large and vibrant and and you know they're all plucked from you know the classics and and just you know just fine art and just amazing i, I think we're just audio right but um i was just i just held up a book that has a, a gorgeous picture of a renaissance madonna with a child so again mm -hmm. i really want people to have the access to let's say what they'd see when they went to morning mass and they missed that that's a touchstone for them or let's see say they went to you know they used to like to go to the park and and you know there was a beautiful scenic overlook or any of those kinds of things all of those visuals of of just verdant nature and and um these museum quality images and, and i want to give people that jewel box i want to hand that back to them so i think that's where where I am. And as far as the, the words go, I've got proverbs and praise and poetry, a lot of a little alliteration there. Um, and just things that really people, um, they recognize right away and they just smile from ear to ear and they just feel like, you know, I get that. And then sometimes they start, I know Naomi File, who's the founder of Validation Therapy. I sent her books early on. She's a hero of mine and she's now, you know, 90 plus. Um, her husband, Ed, was a veteran and a U.S. Naval veteran. He's since passed within the last year or so. And she said, he sang every song with gusto. So I thought, this is my hero telling me that her husband, who she's now a caregiver for, is enjoying these books. So the little moments like that really keep you going. You had a veteran who folds the books in half and puts them in his jacket, you know, those shirt jackets. And when he goes to take a shower, or, you know, um, goes to do an activity, he puts the book down and says, Nobody touched the book. So I just, you know, I, that happened a couple of years ago. When I have a low moment and I'm, you know, reinvesting and re-upping and, and creating fresh content and, you know, there are all kinds of things that are, um, you know, the vexations of, of, of being a small business owner and a sole proprietor. I think about those moments and I think, okay, I can, I can keep pressing on pressed with is, uh, Lorette, is you seem to be hitting the nail on the head, if you will, with the topics and the images. And we do use a piece of our podcast visually. So we'll try to get that in and we will, you know, put some things in show notes, of course. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm actually amazed. It's like when you, the things you were talking about, it's like, those of us that are marketers think like, oh, like what kind of market research is Lorette doing? Um, to be successful. And it sounds like you're having a lot of conversations with individuals, their caregivers and whatnot. So tell us a little bit of, more about that, because you are a, a, an entrepreneur. And, you know, how are you doing that so that you can continue to, um, you know, offer a wide variety of topics and images and really continue to bring joy over generations? And we'll get that answer after a brief word from our commercial sponsors. NASA is always working harder to be your carrier of choice. 
we offer insurance products that can help you meet your retirement goals, such as protecting your savings, securing lifetime income, or paying for health care costs. We're dedicated to providing best-in-class service and are keeping things simple, and we'll have your back. We have around 400,000 policyholders and contract holders and have been doing this for a long time, 170 years, but we remain humble enough to always try to improve. For more information, visit nfg.com. Nassau Insurance products are issued by Nassau Life and Annuity Company of Hartford, Connecticut, Nassau Life Insurance Company, East Greenbush, New York, or Nassau Life Insurance Company of Kansas, Overland Park, Kansas. Subsidiaries of Nassau Financial Group, products are not available in all areas. Policyholder counts are for all Nassau companies as of September 30th, 2022, and are subject to change. Coverite is the first digital concierge health insurance platform focused on Medicare. Their mission is to make Medicare more transparent and accessible for America's 60 million Medicare beneficiaries. By simplifying a traditionally confusing and complex decision, Coverite delivers a simple, seamless, and hassle-free plan selection and enrollment experience. Try the Coverite platform and see for yourself why they've been referred to as the TurboTax for Medicare. Visit Coverite.com slash podcast to learn more. It's a good question. I'm really, as you said, conversations. I'll give you an example. On Thursday of last week, I went with a colleague um, who was worked at the New York Public Library for 25 years, former, um, just a master's in library science, and she's now a certified senior advisor. So we went to the new LiveWell campus in Southington, Connecticut, which is spectacular. It's something you'd see in the Netherlands. It's just amazing. And I, I, I was blown away by it. And they had this beautiful art, this light filled art space. Um, it's an, a man in there who is um, Bob Savage, who is a um, man who's living with dementia himself. He's in his 80s, granddad. Um, lovely, lovely man. And uh, we got to chatting. And, you know, when I left the room after talking with Bob, um, I thought, isn't it neat that he's, he's showing his artwork and showing, you know, what goes on there and, you know, kind of an ambassador, an on-site ambassador. And, and he's engaging in his art. And I thought that was great because he's a maker and, you know, it was really neat. So then I go in another room and I'm talking with some of the leadership and they said that there's, um, there's a woman there who is a resident is they've they're adjacent the part of they have a res, residential community and she was a former teacher and she's doing exactly what I'm doing she's trying to make books um with you know the classics and with and I just thought I need to meet her and and I do have a group of wise women who are former caregivers current caregivers some of them have dementia themselves the woman that I liaise with the most and and have the closest relationship with um she was 88 in August and we have a memory cafe together on the last Thursday of the month. So these are my touchstones and these are my people that, you know, come to me with these great, uh, you know, anecdotes and these great, uh, you know, just little pearls all the time. And that's kind of what, again, inspiration's everywhere. So it's, it's just, um, it's, it's a joy to do this work. And I, sometimes I, I, I would love to just be a content creator and the marketing part. Oh, to your point about marketing, I have these books. I sent you one, a digital book, and it's um, a welcome book. So in order to give really good person-centered care and holistic care, you need to have knowledge of the person, deep knowledge beyond their chart and beyond what, let's say, you know, the daughter can tell you or the husband can tell you in passing. So I created a book that um, has the tenets of the Crisis Prevention Institute and all the best science. And as far as, you know, it's very trauma informed. So you're not asking people questions that are going to, you know, go deep to the point where it's it's going to be, you know, difficult for them. But they unite communities because you you might live across the hall from another woman and you don't have the expressive language skills at that point to kind of like have these deep conversations. Or maybe your, your baseline was you were never a social butterfly or you weren't this, you know, super outgoing person. And you find out she grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn, and so did you. But you only found that out because of what she had in her, one of these books that are like, you know, allow me to introduce myself type books. Or you find out that she doesn't like curry. Like, don't, like, it. it the smell of it through the building is going to knock her to her knees and she's going to be in a mood because, you know, it's just something that just works her nerves. Or 
we all have our bugaboos, right? We all have our peccadilloes. We all have our preferences. And I think to respect those and to know someone well and just know that um, they prefer to shower in the evening. Let's not try to wrestle her and 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 upset her and and you know distress her by, you know, trying to wrangle her into the shower. And and it's just not dignified. She has a cadence to her day. Let's respect her boundaries and her parameters and, and her preferences. It's truly person-centered care. So these books are great because they're a distillation of your likes and your dislikes and and all, more than that. So when you look at the book and you flip through, you can see that. And it's great to have a conversation with a new CNA or a new personal care aide or, um, or a shift change or something goes on or you're sundowning. And because people lose so much of their, you know, their personal effects, their personal artifacts, their little bits of identity that would be in their room, let's say, this is something they can have on their coffee table and they can show to you and engage with you to the degree that they want to and need to. And it's there all the time and it's something that, and you can actually work in it um, and add to it. And the person can embroider or embellish or elide anything they want in their past um, as they choose. So again, it goes back to giving people that little bit of grace, which is, which is, I feel like my, my biggest, um, my, my biggest job, my, my biggest responsibility. I feel really, I'm very, um, what's the word? Uh, I'm very, uh, serious about that. So I'll save everyone some trouble. I don't like curry and I'm a morning shower person. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Quite, you mentioned earlier uh, nostalgia, and I'm, um, you know, I, I like, you know, liked what you said there. So maybe you can elaborate why nostalgia is so important as people are going through this part of the, you know, the journey of dementia and, and what that might mean to them and their family. Sure. So, you know, there was a big push in the early aughts to look into reminiscence and reminiscence therapy, RT, and actually, if you look at PubMed and things like that there was quite a bit of research done and it was found it's not robust. It's, it's not conclusive. It's not strong. And I thought, how can that be? So what I mean by reminiscence therapy, what people mean by RT is that you give somebody a shadow box and it's got all these different items that could be, um, that are yours, that could be, um, you know, touchstones or talismans of your past, let's say, or family photographs, family photo albums, people lean heavily into those. And you know what, there are a lot of people that are in care that don't have either of those. So access um, to those materials. One, that's one of those things. Um, and the research shows that there's a man in um, Africa, uh, Sanda Ismail, who's done tons of work regarding nostalgia therapy. And I'll tell you the difference. People say, well, what's the difference? The difference is there's no expectation in nostalgia. Reminiscence is, mom, that's Jimmy. Don't you remember Jimmy? That's he's your son. Like let's say Jimmy passed away when he was 31 or something. Or mom, that's dad. That's that's dad. Or do you remember that Christmas? Remember that time we went to Tahoe and this and that? And the mom's just like, so she feels like a failure, a failure, a failure, or wanting somehow, or frustrated somehow, and comes away like, I don't know, I don't know. And you can see you can physically see that um, you know, that response, that 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 trauma response, you know, and not trauma meaning like capital T trauma, but you know, just that, that frustration negative. and that, yeah. that stress. So nostalgia therapy is different. It is these resonant themes that are, let's say the holidays or faith traditions, or, and again, you have some agency and some autonomy you're able to choose from the book. So people say in long-term care, like it's great to let people to have, let's say two outfits to, to choose from, or, you know, they can choose from a couple of different entrees or they can choose from a couple of different activities so I like it that people can choose um, the books and the things that, and, and the topics that they want to engage with. And then within them, there is nothing that you could say to them. Um, you, you can make declarative statements, which is great. And you can, you know, it, it can bring things up, but it's not, uh, it, it's not around, do you remember this? Do you remember that? Oh, or like I or something, there was legitimate trauma there and there were legitimate problems there. or There was a fraught relationship or a broken heart or so nostalgia therapy is is benign in its way and it's restorative in its way. And I also like the fact that it gives you a chance to let the person take the lead and kind of 
with with the topic and there's no right or wrong you know and I, I think that that's what's what's really important with nostalgia and what I've used tremendously is genre painting that people are like what is what do you mean by genre paintings genre paintings are all that means is is that it has to do with the road of life it has to do with when dad came home from work at night or um the first loves or bringing home baby or the first bird of spring or all these things that we can relate to and that they can bring us back, you know, through a time slip to that place in our long-term memory. Let's say your working memory and your procedural memory, you're having problems with those things, but you've got these, these beautiful, you know, memories and you're nostalgic for certain things. That's why nostalgia is so powerful. It's, it's giving you a window into the past and into that slant of sun that we're all looking for. I love all the words that you've used so far. And I just, <laughs> I, what's amazing to me is you go way beyond the books and the titles and the words and the images. You are trying and doing a great job, I may add, Lorette, with just whether it's refreshing or giving this, um, you know, this choice, this grace, this um, positivity to individuals um, and, you know, giving them a voice as well. That's what I'm hearing. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how does one um, even engage with the book? So if, for example, if I'm a caregiver and I've purchased one of your books and I'm sitting with uh, my loved one, like, what's a good way to act to, you know, it may sound like common sense, but it isn't to me. So maybe others are interested in hearing this, our, our listeners. What is the way that one engages with their loved ones in your books? Well, first of all, thank you for your support and, and your belief in, in this work and these materials. Um, and they're just resources for people to do what you're talking about. So I did a piece Based on a talk that I did, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, they do a quarterly magazine. So they did a piece on this exact. So this is a wonderful question because this is exactly what they extracted from the talk was how do you engage? How do you enhance engagement with somebody who is experiencing problems with communication? And really, you know, my answer was, you know, and, and my feeling is that to really give that person the warmth and, and the physical, you know, the contact to the extent that you can, as far as, you know, putting your hand on top of their hand and, you know, being speaking down, you know, getting down to their visual, their eye level and, you know, sitting side by side, people really in society, particularly since COVID long for that eye contact and that, you know, that, that physical touch that, you know, um, Naomi file says that, you know, when you're a, a, a baby, an infant, and, and even in the animal kingdom, you know, mammals, you, that you rub the, the this, this temple area or, the mother will nuzzle the child, you know, at, let's say kiss them on, on you know, uh, at their at the crown of their head or on their forehead. And, you know, obviously, if it's a professional care type setting, you wouldn't be doing those things. But you can give, you know, let's say, quote unquote, a side hug and you can stroke someone's hand or you can, you know, get. So I just think that physical connection is important. I think also to really take an interest to really do um, just this exquisite listening. And, and that's what they call it invalidation. And, and, and I believe that to be true when you really listen to what the person's saying and you pick up on cues and let's say they always have a little hanky tucked in their sleeve and it's an observation. So the next time you visit, you might bring them the little hanky. So they see, feel seen and heard. And, and if there's something that they want to express to you to really be there for that. And also when you go before I would do this with my mother-in-law, she liked um, there was a Hanneman, which is like an A&P supermarket near her. And I used to buy her a cold pizza. And by the time I got to her, it was, we would eat cold pizza together, which she really liked. She didn't really like the food there or, and that was more, or the puffs plus tissues because the tissues that they give you, even in a high end residential care place are these garbage tissues that are like a brown paper bag. So I bring her the puffs plus medicated tissues and we'd have a pizza together. So really doing what you would do for anyone you love and that you are, you know, early on when you're in, in a romantic relationship and you're courting and you're dating and you're, you're just so attuned to these thoughtful little things and maybe making someone a Christmas ornament or doing making member when we were younger, we make a mixtape for somebody and things like that. So I think 
the equivalent of the mixtape. You go and you love and you be, and you know, you provide that moment and say like, tell me about this guy. He's coming and going from the room. And, and what do you think? About, what do you think about this guy? And it can all be things that are, they don't require prior knowledge. They don't require, you know, them to dig back and to say like, mom, what'd you have for breakfast? Or I see your tray still here. What time did they bring the tray? And you know, all these things. No, just, just, what do you think, mom? And it, or let's go take a spin around this place. Like, let's see what's going on. Like to be present while you're present and, and just to share these things and, um, you know, point out the things and, and give of yourself, make, make comments and, and observations. And, um, you know, and, and also if there's something good about them and where, of course there's always so many and something that you love about them and something that you miss about them and miss about just the day to day with them, by all means, tell them like every chance you get, build them up every chance you get, you know, in sincerity. And, and, and you know, people know that authentic, you know, um, at a girl, you know what I mean? You, you get that if it's, if it's coming from a place of authenticity. So all those things. So, so elemental, so simple, but that's, you know, as a daughter, as a mother, as a teacher, um, you know, all the different roles, all the different hats I've worn throughout the court, you know, we all wear it throughout the course of our lives. I could say that to anybody. I could say your, your neighbor across the way, all of the things that I just said translate. It, it's, it, we're in such a crazy time in the world and, and, you know, particularly post COVID and, you know, with what's going on now politically, like if you just did something thoughtful, something small, and, and, you know, I think these one-on-one -on -one exchanges and giving somebody a listen, um, that, that, that I think would, would be, you know, a gift to anyone. So, uh, in the spirit of sharing more information, I also don't like cold pizza. So but <laughs> you can put that in your, uh, in your book as well. I got that. I, I'm, I'm picking up on a few things here. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. you know, what I've taken away one probably important thing today, which is the difference between reminiscence and nostalgia. And what that comes back to me is about like words matter and how you ask things matter, which yeah. is, you know, very relevant. So, you know, we're kind of towards the end of our time here. So I'd love to ask you one final question before passing over to Mary. You've done a lot. You've been involved in, you know, you started your career in education. You know, you've done a bunch of different things over the course of your career. Why do you do what you do every day at this point in time? Why is this your... Now an ad from one of our sponsors. Remember when you could trust the news? Well, then check out Walter. Walter is the free, no-nonsense newsletter for grown-ups that comes to your inbox three times a week. From current trends, aging in place, travel, retirement, and everything in between, including a dash of pop culture trivia and throwbacks, Walter is a great way to start your mornings and to stay informed. Oh, and did we mention that it's free? Check us out at thisiswalter.com. Get smart. Get Walter. Passion. Oh, well, the timing for this is um, a gift. I, you know, look at these things that way. And, and I'm now an empty nester. My twins are off both in uh, the Boston area in college. My son Ford is 26, also living in Boston. And, um, you know, I feel like if if you have a gift in, in life, and, and I guess mine is to be the gal by the bedside and, and to be there at your elbow when you're, you know, making a family recipe or that's always been me. That's always been my baseline. Um, you know, my, my interest and my personality and, and my joy. I grew up in a big family. Um, as I said, on Long Island. Um, and I was, I wouldn't say I was parentified cause that's like, Whoa, that's another thing. But I was the second of five. And honestly, we were reading Chekhov's short stories to my brother, Matthew, who was born 10 years later. We were reading The Good Earth, Pearl Buck, to him. And we were driving him around. We had our permits. like, And we were spending that kind of time with him and taking him to the deli. And um, and then we had neighbors that, you know, were, let's say, widows and that were living alone. And, you know, you'd bring over the container of, you know, wonton soup or, or, or leftovers or do whatever. So this is just that. This is taking what I've learned um, you know, um, in my academic life and trying to dig deeper. I've studied just recently with um, Dr. Fong Lung at the um, University, University College London 
and she's the pioneer who created um, cognitive stimulation therapy. So I would get up at four o'clock in the morning and go on, you know, the call and, and because of the time change and um, learn as much as I could about cognitive stimulation. And I thought, what a great, then they use it for social prescribing in the UK and these socially prescribed visits when you get a dementia diagnosis. And I thought, well, that's great, but they're totally missing the mark because there's a person in there. There's so much more to brain games and, and, and cognitive stimulation. And so working with people like that, that are pioneers, that are visionary, that, that are looking to do something that will enhance the lived experience, the, the remainder of someone's of life, reading, leisure reading should be a lifelong pursuit. It should be something that you have access to for your entire life. And again, I thought, this is great, but how could we make this better for people? And how could we give them, um, you know, again, the exposure to these and, and this resource them with these beautiful, beautiful things that they they have to miss. Cause you can see sometimes they'll just turn a page. You won't say a thing and they'll just, they're just tears will roll because they're seeing something that like is so elemental to them and so deeply spiritual and touching. My grandmother used to go to church by herself every day in Great Neck, New York to St. Aloysius, um, where many of us were, I was christened at a different church um, in Manhasset where I grew up, but there was this giant mural. And I almost burst into tears when I saw one that I had um, a mural just like that, but that had the, the big lilies, um, the day lilies. And um, I just thought for her to see again, these, you know, with the shades of sea foam green and just the beautiful, the, the drooping heads of the lilies and just the beautiful scenes and all the lamb and, you know, up in the fields and in the distance. And it just had a little bit of a iridescence. And I thought for her to me to bring that to her when she was in care and for her to see that it's like just relax into that and, and immerse yourself in that and have that moment. That's why I love the large format so much. So, um, it goes back to vision, right? And whatever's in front of you. And if you can put something in front of someone that affirms and, and validates and brings somebody a moment of joy. Well, you've inspired me for sure. Joseph, I am, would guess the same. No curry though, right? <laughs> no curry, no cold pizza either. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I love the, I love the humanity. Glad I can, glad I can entertain. <laughs> I, I, lo I love the, the humor that Joseph brings to our yeah. podcast, and I love the humanity that you brought today. And I, I see you as, as a librarian, too. I could see you, uh, you know, teaching courses on this with books. Um, I, I can see you doing so much more. So we'll have to talk offline. Lorette, I have some ideas. Um, but if folks want to get in touch with you, if they want to learn more, if they want to purchase your books, or they want to get you to come and share all the things you've shared on our podcast today, what would be that best way? You can get me at nanasbookseries.com. Um, you can call me directly. Um, we can give the, you know, the number, my phone number in the links. I'm a big texter. Um, you know, I next to my family, meaning my children, my husband, but, um, there's nothing I, I could, you know, wax on, uh, about more and, and with greater joy than, than this particular topic. Like I, I love to, the fact, I love the fact that somebody can take this and they can, it, it can belong to them and it's theirs and it's not shunted off onto some book card or it's put in the, you know, the recreation therapy room or, um, you know, I, this is something that w belongs to you. It's gently priced. It's something that is just a very, uh, this is low hanging fruit. We're not talking about programs and, and all these big, it, it's like Stephen King says, a book is portable magic. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a type of portable magic. So text me, call me. Nanasbookseries.com is the site. You can get all the information. Um, and reach out because I will chat you up. <laughs> Laura, or your firm. I'll chat, I'll chat up your entire firm. Call me. <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure. And we will put everything in the show notes. So as we come to an end, uh, Joseph, thank you for joining us as well. And Lorette, it's been truly a pleasure. You've inspired us. Uh, just thinking of all of my senses or you've awoken them and, and, and you do that for so many. And we really appreciate that. We look forward to uh, seeing everyone or hear everyone to hear us for our next episode of the Prime Life Podcast. 
follow us, like us, give us feedback, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, guys. Remember to subscribe to the Prime Life Podcast anywhere you find podcasts. You can find all of our episodes, contact information, and more on our website, primelifepodcast.com. Stay connected with us. Follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok.